Praise be Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen. My name is Christopher Snaith. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm here today to talk about uh, Our Lady Guadalupe. We're going to be doing a three-part series um, <clears throat> on Our Lady of Guadalupe, starting with uh, who is Our Lady of Guadalupe to the Spanish, or who was she to the Spanish, uh, who was she to the Aztecs, and um, who is she to us today. I'd like to thank Timothy Flanders for the opportunity to share this beautiful event with you here on The Meaning of Catholic. <clears throat> so the first two parts of this presentation will be uh, pre-recorded videos. So as I say, it's three parts, so there's going to be three different videos coming out. Um, <clears throat> so the first two will be pre-recorded, pre and then the third one will be uh, live with, on uh, our Feast of Lady of Guadalupe with uh, Kennedy Hall and Luis Medina. <clears throat> So what we're going to start with before uh, getting into the topic of today's presentation, which is who is she to the Spanish, uh, we're just going to do a brief summary of uh, the event, the story of Juan Diego. Um, <clears throat> so it begins on December 8th uh, in Mexico. This is uh, in 1531, 10 years after the conquest uh, of the Aztec Empire by uh, Hernan Cortes. <clears throat> so, Our Lady appeared to a neophyte named Juan Diego. Juan Diego <clears throat> lived north of uh, Tenochtitlan, which is Mexico City today, um, and he lived about four hours north of the city, and he was a neophyte, meaning he's a new Catholic, and so he would walk the four hours to Tenochtitlan every day uh, to attend his catechism classes. Juan Diego was uh, probably in his 40s at the time, um, <clears throat> and so he would make this trip every day. And so on this particular day, uh, December 8, uh, as he was passing by Tepeyac Hill, uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe appeared to him, <clears throat> and she approached him and she asked him if he could go to the local bishop, Juan de Zumarraga, and ask him to build a church there to her honor. <clears throat> so Juan Diego went to the bishop. Uh, he was met with resistance. Um, and so Our Lady had to uh, encourage him. She appeared to him again. Um, and so Juan Diego persisted with the bishop. So finally the bishop asked for a sign. And then <clears throat> the Our Lady told Juan Diego to come back the next day. So this was already on... December 10th when this happened. She asked him to come back on December 11th um, and she would give him the sign <clears throat> and so he came he he was going to come back that day but unfortunately his uncle um, Juan Bernardino <clears throat> he was quite sick um, they thought he was going to die and so Juan Diego spent the day caring for his uncle and late into the evening, his uncle asked him to go back to the city to get a priest so that he could have last rites. Um, so early in the morning, like one o'clock, something like that, um, Juan Diego started the trek back to the city. Again, it's a four hour trip. <clears throat> and uh, when he got to the hill, it was early morning, uh, Tepeyac Hill. Um, and so Our Lady, he, like he, he decided he'd go a different way today because he was embarrassed he didn't come uh, come back yesterday like she had told him so he was going to try to avoid her uh, but she intercepted him <clears throat> told him that his uncle would be fine um, promised him that and then told him that the sign that he was to take to the bishop was going to be flowers and he she sent him to go to the top of the hill to pick these flowers he so he did that gathered them in his tilma, he came down, she arranged the flowers in his tilma, and then sent him to the bishop. So when Juan Diego got to the bishop, he opened up his tilma to show the sign, which was the flowers, and they went tumbling to the floor, and on his tilma was the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And from that event, <coughs> um, mass conversions started taking place with the, with the natives. Um, over five years, eight million 
natives converted uh, to the Catholic faith <coughs> in Mexico. Okay. <clears throat> so this story comes to us from a manuscript called the Nikan Mapoa, uh, which means here is told, or here it is told. <clears throat> uh, we think that it was written by a Mexican Catholic named Antonio Valeriano around 1560, so this would have been 30 years later. Um, <clears throat> it's believed that when Mary told Juan Bernardino how to identify her when telling the bishop, so at the same time that Mary was uh, appearing to Juan Diego um, on December 12, uh, telling him what the sign would be and promising him that his uncle would be healthy and, and, and saved, um, she also appeared to his uncle, Juan Bernardino, and healed him miraculously. And <clears throat> so she told Juan, Juan Bernardino to go to the bishop and tell, um, tell him about the healing. And so it's believed that <clears throat> when she did that, um, and she, she gave him the na her name, her title, uh, that she could uh, that he could identify her with to the bishop. Um, it's believed <clears throat> that she said "tre quat le chipeu," which means the one who crushes the head of the serpent. Uh, that's that's the local tradition in Mexico. Actually, the Nican Mapola doesn't say that. It says um, uh, "quenquisca each." Potzintli Santa Maria de Guadalupe, which is a mix of Nahua, uh, which is the Aztec language, and Spanish, and it means <clears throat> the perfect Virgin Holy Mary of Guadalupe. Um, so it's not clear if the local tradition is correct or if what's recorded in the Nican Mapoa is correct, but either way, the important thing is that uh, from the standpoint of the Spanish, they identified this event with Guadalupe. <clears throat> okay, and why is that important? Well, it's important because there was already an existing devotion uh, in Spain to Our Lady of Guadalupe in uh, Extremadura province. Um, and I'll kind of explain that a little bit later. Um, but it's uh, Guadalupe is actually a... Um, <clears throat> an Arabic-Spanish term. It's a mix of Arabic and Spanish. So it, uh, guad, guada comes from the Arabic word wadi, which means river. And lupe comes from the, the Latin uh, lupus, which means wolf. So it means river of the wolf, which is really interesting, actually, which I'll get to. Okay. So <clears throat> what we're going to go through today is how did the Spanish react to Our Lady of Guadalupe, and why? And did Our Lady intend to communicate something to the Spanish um, in this apparition? And I believe she did. <clears throat> so there's two basic ways that the Spanish responded to this apparition. Um, one was they denied its validity. They didn't think it was a, a valid apparition. Uh, they thought it was a false apparition that started a uh, an Indian cult worship. Um, there's a there's good reason for why they uh, reacted this way, um, and we'll get to that. Uh, the other way is that they recognized that it was a valid apparition, that it was important, that it resulted in so many conversions, and all of that. And so those are kind of the two basic ways that the Spanish responded. And we know that because we know that there were, uh, we have writings from the time um, in, in the like 30 to 60 years afterwards where we have um, <clears throat> different people, Franciscans and other, and, and other um, uh, writers from other orders, uh, as well as uh, non-religious who talked about it, who thought it was a, a, a cult superstition and they didn't think it was a valid um, <clears throat> apparition. And in fact, there were two competing um, Marian devotions in Mexico um, at the time 
in the, in the wake of uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe. One was this one, Our Lady of Guadalupe, and the other one was Our Lady of Los Remedios, which was another devotion from Spain. Uh, it was associated with um, <clears throat> the uh, freeing of Christians from uh, captivity from the Muslims. Um, and she had performed many miracles um, to, to accomplish that. And so those were two kind of cult traditions that were, um, that were in competition at the time. One was seen as the Indian tradition, uh, the Indian cult of Mary, and the other one was seen as the Spanish cult of Mary. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think what Our Lady intended to show, and I think what th those Spanish who received the apparition um, took from it, was that she accepted the Indians um, who converted <clears throat> as her own, you know, as her own children, part of the church, um, and that she was their mother, <clears throat> but that she also wanted to remind uh, the Spanish that she was their mother also, their special patroness, and one of the things that a mother does is she corrects her children. <clears throat> okay. So, to get an understanding of why the Spanish um, reacted negatively to um, <clears throat> to this apparition. I kind of want to give a brief Spanish history, so I'm going to go <clears throat> hopefully quickly through this. Um, there's a lot to go through, but the, you, you'll see why I want to go go through, why I'm going through all of it and showing it to you um, at the end. I'll kind of explain it, but. We're going to start way back in 12,000 BC. <clears throat> so here we go. So early Spain was populated by Iberian tribes. That's why it's known as the Iberian Peninsula. <clears throat> in 12,000 BC, Celtic peoples migrated into the peninsula, uh, largely replacing the local populations, although there were large areas that were still dominated by uh, Iberians. Um, <clears throat> Over the next 200 years, the Celts mixed with Iberians, creating the Celtiberi culture. Um, <clears throat> around 900 BC, so 300 years later, the Phoenicians, who were the Canaanites uh, from, uh, from the Middle East, they established uh, trade ports along the coast of Iberia. By about 750 BC, they established their first colony. Um, <clears throat> and over the next 200 years, um, the surrounding Iberian cultures um, adopted and mixed with the Phoenician culture. Um, <clears throat> around 570 BC, the Greeks established their first colony in Iberia. Uh, by 550, the Empire of Carthage, which was Phoenician, took control over southern Iberia. Um, and at the same time, um, Eastern Iberia was taken control of by the Greeks, by the uh, Republic of Massalia. <clears throat> However, still at this time, most of Iberia is still controlled by the Celtiberi. <clears throat> About 50 years later, around 500 BC, Gauls migrated into the northwest uh, part of the peninsula, <clears throat> and they established many tribes, uh, mixing with local populations, as usually happens. Around 230 BC, Carthage expands militarily into Iberia, conquering about half of the peninsula. Um, and by this time, because of the Phoenician and the Greek colonies, um, the other tribes started to formalize governments. And so um, by this time, when Carthage expanded and took over half of the peninsula, <clears throat> the Gauls, Lusitanians, Astures, Cantabari, uh, Cantabri, Celtiberi, and the Il, um, Ilergete, uh, they all had very established borders and, and dominions. <clears throat> Around 200 BC, so this is 30 years after the expansion of Carthage, r the Romans joined in the military race to conquer all of eastern Iberia. Um, <clears throat> and then it takes them almost 200 years, up until 19 BC, to finally conquer every last tribal domain in, in Iberia. And at this point, 
the whole place becomes Roman. It becomes a Roman province called Hispania. <clears throat> All right. In 40 AD, <clears throat> Hispania uh, is introduced to Christianity by St. James the Greater. In 313, Constantine legalizes Christianity throughout the empire, including Spain. In 410, various Germanic peoples, including the Suebi and the Vandals, migrated into Hispania and they establish five different kingdoms um, in, in, <coughs> uh, in contest with Rome. And so they've taken control, these five kingdoms, of about half the peninsula. And over the next 50 years, Rome wages war against these kingdoms, and eventually the kingdom of Suebi takes control of most of the, the peninsula. In 458, the Visigoths, who were Aryan, they were from Eastern Europe, they migrated, uh, <coughs> migrated west into Spain, into uh, Hispan well, well, the Suebi uh, kingdom at this point. Um, they conquer most of the peninsula, <clears throat> and over the next 20 years, they're in conflict with Rome. Rome basically takes over the, the, the whole peninsula again, but then the Visigoths come back and they eventually take over most of the, uh, most of Hispania. Um, in 560 AD, Byzantium establishes a province along the southern coast of the Visigothic kingdom because Again, this is mostly Visigothic at this point. There's still, Swaby still has a kingdom uh, in the north, uh, northwest. <clears throat> um, in 585, the Visigoths conquers the Swabies. <clears throat> Excuse me. One second. <clears throat> in 585, <clears throat> the Visigoths conquered the Swabies. And then in 587, the Visigothic kingdom converted to Catholicism. And this was mainly done uh, by the work of St. Leander. Uh, he was able to convert the, um, the king, King Recared. And so they had the Council of Toledo, and at that council, that's when um, the kingdom officially converted to Catholicism, and the Aryan properties were basically handed over to the Catholic Church. Okay, <clears throat> for the next 120 years or so, um, the Visigothic Kingdom ruled there uh, peacefully, except towards the latter part of that they went into civil war, which was perfect for the next group to come in and invade, which was the Umayyad Caliphate, who were Muslim. And that happened in 711 AD. So they came up from Africa, <clears throat> and they conquered the entire peninsula in five years. In 718, the kingdom of Asturias, which was Catholic, was established along the northern coast. <clears throat> and uh, that's when the Reconquista began. So over the next hundred years, though, waves of Arabs and Berbers migrated into Spain from other parts of the Muslim world and Islam was heavily practiced there. The Reconquista took 774 years to complete, and the main Catholic kingdoms involved were the Kingdom of Asturias, of course. That became the Kingdom of Leon. Um, Portugal was established at a later date, um, and also Aragon. Uh, there was also the Kingdom of Castile, which was central to this. Um, they, they, at some point, um, I think it was uh, 1230 AD, they joined together with Leon and became one kingdom. And then toward the end of the Reconquista, uh, Castile and Aragon uh, became a united kingdom, the kingdom of Spain. Uh, and that was under uh, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. In 1492, when the last Muslim stronghold, Granada, was finally defeated, Castile and Aragon, uh, as I said, they had become uh, the Kingdom of Spain, and it remained Spain throughout this period that we're talking about, which was um, uh, the, the 
the time of the conquest of the New World and uh, the apparition of Our Lady of Guadalupe. <clears throat> okay, so that's a really high-level summary of the history of Spain. The idea here I wanted to show was the sheer volume of different cultures and peoples that um, that that came to Spain over its over its history. You had uh, the Celts, the Iberians, uh, the Greeks, the Phoenicians, who were a, a Semitic people. Uh, you had the um, the Romans, of course, uh, the Goths, the Gauls, Germanic peoples, just. And then, of course, the Berbers, um, North Africans, Arabs, just this this uh, really, really wide variety of, of people and cultures um, that conquered and reconquered and, and fought over Spain over its, its long history. <clears throat> I think it's really important to understand that because when it comes to the New World, <clears throat> I think... The idea that this Spanish people were now going to be mixing with and becoming a single people with the Mexican natives, um, it's appropriate because you don't have just like this one kind of ethnic identity in Spain. It's this whole mix of a whole bunch of different people there. And so it's not a, it's not a, a strange step for them to come and mix with a new people in the new world. Okay, <clears throat> in 1478, so this would be, um, 14 years before <clears throat> the discovery of the New World, the Spanish Inquisition is established in Spain to deal with conversos. Conversos were people who, whether they were Muslim, Jewish, um, a different Christian sect, um, and I, I always forget the name of the, the, the predominant um, heretical sect at the time. <clears throat> anyway, there were people who, who supposedly converted, but didn't really convert. They just did that um, so that they wouldn't be harassed publicly. Well, what was happening at the time, not just in Spain, but also in other parts of, of Europe, which is why the inquisitorial courts were established in the first place was somebody would be accused <clears throat> of heresy or being a false convert um, and then there would be a mob of people who attacked them and killed them and this wasn't good for public order it wasn't good for the people obviously who were killed especially if they were innocent and so the, the inquisitorial courts were established to give people a fair trial. And the courts have, <clears throat> well, today they don't have such a great reputation, but that's because of propaganda. But historically, they had a very uh, high uh, reputation. Um, many, many people who were accused of other crimes, um, they asked to be sent to the uh, inquisitor the inquisitorial courts um, <clears throat> on charge of blasphemy or something like that so that they could get a fairer trial because they knew that the inquisitorial courts were which were ecclesiastical courts they were the church courts were more fair more just than the secular courts and so that's what was going on um, in Spain because of the Reconquista um, and it's you know, it, it was 774 years of winning back the lands from, um, from a very uh, powerful enemy, the Muslims, who were a very devout people. <clears throat> there was um, a lot of accusations of false conversion, so the converso uh, issue. And so to temper the... Um, the anger of the people against these um, false accusations or sometimes you know not false accusations um, the Spanish Inquisition was more aggressive 
that's why it has the reputation it has. It was more aggressive than uh, than the inquisitorial courts in other in other countries. Um, it's because of the hot-blooded people <laughs> in Spain, and so the uh, the government had to be seen <clears throat> to come down hard on conversos and to to deal with the problem aggressively, so that the people had confidence um, confidence in it. Okay. Uh, so that that's one thing that was going on. Uh, in 1486, Christopher Columbus began negotiations with King Ferdinand II and Queen Isabella I. Um, but they told him at the time that they needed to finish uh, their war with the Kingdom of Granada, the Muslim Kingdom of Granada, first, before they could commit funds to his mission. <clears throat> so... <clears throat> He had to wait until 1492, when the Kingdom of Granada fell, the war was over, and then they were able to, to give him money to make his voyage to find a new um, trade passage to India, which turned out to be discovery of the New World. So he discovered the New World in 1492. He returned that, well, he discovered the islands of the Caribbean. He returned to Spain that same year to give thanks, and when they were returning to Spain, um, <clears throat> he and his crew, they were beset by a severe storm, and so they, they prayed, and they made a promise that they would do pilgrimages, um, something like four or five pilgrimages to various Marian shrines throughout Spain, um, if they got through the, the storm safely. And they drew straws to see who would go to which um, pilgrimage site. And the one that um, Christopher Columbus drew was to Our Lady of Guadalupe. And so uh, they got through the storm safely. So he did fulfill his promise. He went on pilgrimage to Our Lady of Guadalupe Monastery in Extremadura province, thanked Our Lady for the safe voyage. <clears throat> and then the next year, 1493, he made his second voyage to the New World. Um, they discovered more islands, one of which was the island of Carucara, and he renamed the island, well, he named it, he didn't, he probably didn't know the name of the island at the time, but he named the island Guadalupe, in honor of Our Lady of Guadalupe, and for the safe passage that he'd received. And it's still called Guadalupe today. So in his diaries, <coughs> Christopher Columbus talks about the, the natives on the islands in one of two general ways. Um, the f natives that he first discovered, and he, you know, on different islands, he, you know, discovered different peoples, but generally speaking, they were all kind of the same. Um, they were innocent, um, very generous, beautiful complexion and skin and all that kind of stuff, very industrious people, intelligent. And the thing that he put in his diary, which was <clears throat> also reported in his letters to the king, um, very, very likely to convert because they were such a virtuous people. <clears throat> Later on, um, when they were discovering some of the northern islands, like Cuba and, and other ones, uh, they discovered another people that they called the Caribs. Um, that's probably what they were uh, known as among the, uh, the islanders. In fact, that's where we get the name Caribbean from, is from the Caribs. <clears throat> uh, the Caribs, though, they were very different from the other islanders. Um, they were a vicious people. They were very warlike. Um, they were cannibalistic. They did human sacrifice. They were uh, promiscuous. Um, they just a very vicious people, not like the other ones uh, at all, really, in a lot of ways. <clears throat> In 1498, Columbus discovers the mainland of South America, and at that time, both Spain and Portugal started building colonies in the, um, the Caribbean islands. In 1519, Hernán Cortés, who was from Extremadura province, um, when he was in Cuba, he was elected captain of the third expedition to the mainland. Um, so he went with uh, three ships, I think it was three ships, and 300 soldiers, 
Um, <clears throat> when he got there, he planted the Spanish flag, claimed the land for the king, uh, and then he proceeded to make alliances um, with local tribes as he marched to Tenochtitlan. And here is the route that he took. So you can see on the west side there, that's where he landed. And all of those red dots are different tribes um, that he stopped at um, and that he made alliances with. Some of these were part of the Triple Alliance of the, um, the Aztec Empire. Some of them were not. Some of them were the enemies of the empire. Um, but the consistent uh, kind of sentiment among them was they were kind of not happy with <clears throat> the Mexica of Tenochtitlan, um, who were a very warlike people. Okay, Cortez's experience with the natives was similar to Columbus. Uh, some tribes were worthy of alliance because they were very virtuous and all that kind of stuff. Whereas other ones, like the Mexica of Tenochtitlan, were warlike, cannibalistic. They did human sacrifice and all that kind of stuff. So Cortez's experience was similar, like I say, to Columbus. There were these kind of two... It was like a dichotomy among the native people, <clears throat> in their eyes anyway. Important because Cortez was from uh, Extremadura, which is where the monastery of Our Lady of Guadalupe is. Um, he was familiar with that uh, devotion, and actually he carried a s small statue of Our Lady of Guadalupe with him throughout his uh, conquest of the Aztec Empire. In 1420 or 1521, sorry, um, Cortez finally conquers Tenochtitlan. There was actually a um, he was initially welcomed uh, with friendship, then they were ousted from the city, and then there was a, then they had to besiege the city. It was, there's a lot more to it than what I've talked about here, but <clears throat> at the end of the day in 1521 is when the Aztec Empire officially falls to Cortez. All right. <clears throat> so during this period, the Spanish cosmological paradigm was being seriously challenged. Before the discovery of the New World, they believed, as with most Europeans, that the world was Trinitarian in its design. So there was the continents that they knew about were Europe, Africa, and Asia. So three, three continents that they, that they knew about. <clears throat> and so they believed that this design was purposeful on God's part. Um, in, refle in reflection of his Trinitarian nature. When they discover the New World, that was difficult for them to understand. And when they, um, <clears throat> when they started conversing with the natives, one of the things that they learned about was their god Quetzalcoatl, who was the feathered serpent god, who the natives believed was their creator. And so the Spanish soldiers, <clears throat> not being highly educated, they th took that to mean that Satan, who was a serpent, was the creator of these people. And so they mistakenly thought that these, uh, these people were offspring of the devil, which was kind of supported a little bit by, you know, some of their practices like human sacrifice and cannibalism and that kind of stuff. In 1524, the Franciscans <laughs> start arriving to evangelize the natives, and this is really when the soldiers are corrected. The, obviously, the Franciscans, being a lot more educated, they understood that the devil doesn't have the power to create, only God does, that these people were just lost brethren. Um, so, <clears throat> over the next seven years, uh, tensions start to grow between the natives, the Spanish soldiers, the Franciscans, the native converts, all of them don't like each other. And so in 1528, Bishop-elect Juan de Zumarraga arrives, and he's really sent there to be the protector of the Indians, and to settle the disputes and things that are going on, because during that time a lot of political intrigue was taking place, and so 
Wanda's and Moraga was brought there to be an administrator <clears throat> as well to kind of like get rid of certain people who are doing politics that they shouldn't be doing and and get new people in there and that kind of stuff however after three years uh, the bishop felt like his efforts weren't going anywhere um, he felt like the place was a, a powder keg and it was about to explode at any minute so on December 7 1531 <clears throat> he sent a letter to the king explaining the situation and then he spent the night in prayer asking for divine help and the next day a neophyte named Juan Diego arrived at his door <clears throat> in answer to his prayer. He just didn't know it yet. Okay. So, why did some of the Spanish reject the apparition? <clears throat> so, one reason would be, <clears throat> especially among the soldiers, um, they had had success for the last 700 years slow success but success nonetheless in uh, defeating their enemies the Muslims and um, especially in 1492 when they finally overthrew them and ousted them from Spain um, the conquistadors uh, felt probably invincible <clears throat> they had uh, they had God on their side, they had the power of Our Lady assisting them, and um, they felt that they could defeat the world, probably. And with all of these natives converting, there was nobody left to fight, at least not immediately. And so it tempered a desire among some of the soldiers that probably didn't want to be tempered. <clears throat> With the recent history in Spain of the conversos and the Inquisition, there was suspicion <clears throat> that with 8 million Indians converting over the span of five years, that they weren't legitimate conversions. That they weren't um, sincere in their, um, their conversion to the faith. And so the sentiment of suspicion that had pervaded Spain with the conversos there um, came to the New World with the Spanish. And so <clears throat> that's part of the reason, again, why um, this apparition was looked on with suspicion. The other reason was that um, at least some of the Indians, definitely not all, as we've seen through Cortez and Columbus' experience in their diaries, um, a lot of the Indians seemed particularly barbaric to the Spanish um, with their open polyamory, uh, the human sacrifice, especially the way that it was done, very brutal, um, lots of bloodshed, <clears throat> um, the, the flower, worlds which, flower wars which they learned about, which were annual uh, which was an, an an annual event of warfare that was planned out and and, and carried out um, regularly <clears throat> um, with the cannibalism just all that kind of stuff like that was all very barbaric and not even their their greatest enemy in Spain the the Muslims um, engaged in that kind of behavior and so um, the particular uh, the particular um, barbarism practiced by uh, the natives here in uh, Central America that gave again suspicion to the Spanish that these people could be so easily converted so these are the reasons why not everybody was so keen on this apparition and, and looked at it with suspicion and <clears throat> with the, the uh, Guadalupe cult they looked at it as a superstitious Indian cult and so that's <clears throat> unfortunately what was going on with some of them but as I say others did accept the apparition and to get an understanding of why 
uh, besides, you know, just the miraculous event itself, which only very few people were actually um, exposed to. Uh, why did this become associated with Guadalupe? Um, what did it mean to the Spanish who accepted it? I think to understand that, it's really important to go back to the beginning and look at a Marian history in Spain. <clears throat> All right. So in 40 AD, as I say, uh, as I said before, St. James the Greater was evangelizing in Hispania. That's when Christianity was introduced there uh, to the Roman province. He wasn't having very much success, and so... <clears throat> um, so he prayed one night in sadness, um, asking for divine inter uh, intervention, uh, for help converting these people because he was not having much success. <clears throat> and so this is the first recorded um, Marian apparition in history, is in 40 AD which is interesting because Mary was still alive. She was in Jerusalem at the time. And so <laughs> she, we believe, bilocated um, to Spain. She appeared with many angels and she came standing on top of a pagan pillar. <clears throat> and we believe that that signified um, her conquest over the pagans because she was standing on top of it. But she also gave it to him, she gave him the pillar, um, <clears throat> as uh, uh, the foundation for the um, faith in Spain, for the uh, Marian devotion in Spain. And actually, there was a church that was built on that spot, um, which is what she requested in that apparition. Um, and that was the first church built dedicated to Our Lady. And that was in Spain. So she gave the pillar. She also gave <clears throat> a small statue of herself and the child Jesus. And she said, this is to be my house. And this image and column shall be the title and altar of the temple that you shall build. And the people of this land will honor greatly my son Jesus. <clears throat> so this is... An ancient, ancient tradition. Um, I believe the earliest reference <clears throat> we have to Marian devotion in Spain is from t uh, carvings, paintings on tombs that show like the uh, the Assumption and things like that. Um, <clears throat> and so we can see that Marian devotion is really, really early in Spain. And it's potentially um, originating from this. And so Mary gives a promise, <clears throat> a prophecy, that the people of Spain would greatly honor her son. And so that is, that is something that the Spanish people hold on to through their history, especially when it comes to the, the con uh, Reconquista and the discovery of the New World. They associate this work with this promise that Our Lady gave in 40 AD. What I want to focus on, though, is the image <clears throat> of, uh, of Mary and the child Jesus, because the image is the image of Mary as mother. And that's really, <clears throat> she says, you know, this, this shall be my title. So the image is her as mother. Therefore, her, her title for the Spanish people is as mother. <clears throat> and so a mother stays with her children. She protects them. She nourishes them. She teaches them. <clears throat> she defends them from the enemies, from their enemies. She does all these things. And in fact, we see she does those things for the people of Spain through their history. Um, <clears throat> for the next part here, I, I'm going to shift away from Spain for a moment. We're going to go to Rome. But it's important because what's going to happen here is going to have impact on, on Spain, especially as it relates to Our Lady Guadalupe. 
So in 352, <clears throat> John of Rome and his wife wanted to dedicate their property to the Virgin Mary. So this is after Constantine has legalized Christianity uh, throughout the empire, about 40 years later. Uh, so Mary appeared to the couple as they were praying one night, and she requested a church to be built on Esquiline Hill in Rome. And this church would become known as St. Mary Major, which is still there today. <clears throat> and she said when they go to the hill, they will be given a sign of where to build the church. So they go there, and actually they meet Pope Liberius on the hill. And he had also received an apparition of Our Lady the day before, telling him to go here, that there would be a sign to build a church. And so the miracle was there was snowfall which is important because it was in August at the time. And the snow fell precisely in the pattern that the church was supposed to be built. <clears throat> it was in its, its outline, its perimeter. And that's the only place on the hill that the snow fell. So they built this church. It became the Basilica of Mary Major. And in this basilica, there were two relics, two ancient relics, uh, sorry, uh, that was Our Lady of the Pillar, which was what I was talking about before. I just forgot to show you the image. Um, there were two relics that were stored there. <clears throat> Both Mary as mother, uh, showing her, her motherhood. Uh, Mary with the child Jesus. Both of these were purported to have been carved and painted by Saint Luke the Evangelist. And so the one on the right, uh, that's the statue obviously, um, that was given as a gift by Saint Gregory the Great to Saint Leander for his work in converting the Visigoths. And the icon, that one was, that one is still in Saint Mary Majors, today, <clears throat> and it's known as Our Lady of the Snows. But both are purported to have been um, produced by Saint Luke. Now, important, before this was given to uh, Saint Leander, in 541 to 549, the first known plague pandemic broke out in the Old World. It was known as the Justinian Plague. It was caused by the same bacterium that caused the Black Death 800 years later. And at this time, <clears throat> it killed somewhere between 15 to 100 million people. We don't know how many exactly, but it was a lot. That's the important point. Very deadly disease. It spread throughout the Mediterranean populations, and it flared up again in Rome in 590. This was known as the Roman Plague. Well, the newly elected Pope Gregory I, Gregory the Great, he organized seven processions uh, through um, Rome, which were asked, which were dedicated to asking for the protection of Mary on Rome, and they all ended at the Basilica of Mary Major. In two of these processions, were carried these two relics. One of them had Our Lady of the Snows, and the other one had the statue. And at the end of the processions, when they all gathered at St. Mary Major's, <clears throat> Pope Gregory had a vision of St. Michael holding a, fl uh, uh, a flaming sword, and he sheathed it. And <clears throat> after that event, the plague ended. It was over. It was done. <clears throat> and so... This gift that was given to St. Leander for his work in converting the Aryan kingdom of the Visigoths, this gift was the statue that you see on the right, <clears throat> which is associated with ending the, the Roman plague and being carved, obviously, by St. Luke. <clears throat> well, when the... So this, okay, so this statue was housed in uh, Seville, um, which is where St. Leander was the bishop. Well, when the, when the Moors invaded during the Umayyad Caliphate, <clears throat> the, uh, 
the priests of Seville fled the city north, and they buried the statue. Uh, <clears throat> they buried the statue uh, north of the city. And they buried it with all of its paperwork so that if it was found later, um, people would know what it was. <clears throat> so in 1326, this is 600 years into the Reconquista, when most of Spain had been retaken. A Spanish farmer named Gil Cordero, he had an apparition of Our Lady. He had been looking for his lost cow, which he found. And the cow looked like it was dead. It was on the ground, it wasn't moving. <clears throat> and it suddenly sprang up, and Our Lady appeared. And <clears throat> she asked Gil to get the local uh, bishops, bishop and priests to come to that spot to dig there for a holy relic and to build a church there in her honor. Which they did, and they discovered this statue. Sorry, that's not the right one. So that is the statue today in Extremadura, Spain. This is called today the Statue of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And that is the origin of the devotion of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Spain. This statue, <clears throat> as I say, carved by St. Luke, depicts Mary uh, and her motherhood. Um, she's with the child Jesus. Um, it's a very prominent devotion in Spain. Um, King Alfonso XI won the Re Battle of Rio Salado um, later in the 1300s uh, and attributed it to Our Lady of Guadalupe because he had done a pilgrimage there um, asking for her intercession. It was a very important victory actually because after that the, the Muslims were never able to again make any further incursions into Spain <coughs> after that victory. And so, because of that, um, King Alfonso XI built a large, he, he, he built a new church, uh, much larger, as well as a large monastery attached to it in honor of Our Lady of Guadalupe. <clears throat> and that's why it became a major pilgrimage site by the time uh, Christopher Columbus came on the scene. All right. Now, the reason it's called Our Lady of Guadalupe is because of where it was found. <clears throat> it was found, uh, you can see there, kind of in the center, just uh, on the northern part of that highlighted yellow section. That is the monastery of Our Lady of Guadalupe. That's where the statue was found, and it's just north of Guadalupe River, which is the highlighted section. <clears throat> I think that's providential because the wolf in scripture is associated with the enemies of the church. Uh, wolves in sheep clothing and all that stuff. And so Our Lady, and you could look at it this way, I think, Our Lady is standing above Guadalupe, the river of wolves, meaning she stands above or she is the conqueror of the enemies of the church. Okay. <clears throat> so by the time Our Lady appeared to Juan Diego in 1531, Spain had received already at least 32 other known apparitions in its long history. Keeping in mind, okay, so we're 1500 years, but 700 years of that was Reconquista. Um, a lot of that was under the Visigothic Kingdom as Arian, the Swaby Kingdom as Pagan. Um, <clears throat> the early early portion of, of its history under Rome, uh, the Christ, uh, 
early portion of its Christian history under Rome uh, was still largely pagan. So <clears throat> it's not exactly 1,500 years that we're talking about here. Um, <clears throat> but that is the period that it covers. 32 known apparitions. And included in those apparitions were healings. Um, many gifts were left. Uh, so, of course, the pillar was left. Um, three statues, including... Uh, so, the, the Our Lady of the Pillar. There was this one, and there was another one. Two, two sashes, or belts, were left by her. A golden chasuble was given to a priest... <clears throat> um, three relic paintings and icons were left or found uh, by her intercession and three other holy images were left <clears throat> so gift giving by Our Lady to her children was uh, a common thing in Spanish uh, Marian history and so Again, the leaving of the image on the tilma wouldn't have seen, been seen as unusual uh, in the context, the wider context of Marian intervention in Spain. She also is attributed to winning many battles, especially against the Muslims, but she also helped convert the, or at least she's associated with the conversion of the Arians because she was given as a gift um, to St. Leander for that work. So she's associated with with the conversion of heretics, uh, the, the, the conquering of the enemies <coughs> of the church, um, healing, so again the statue was associated with ending a plague, um, as well as many healings um, in the 30, uh, 32 other apparitions. So just all of these things that Mary does are very motherly. Um, for her children, the Spanish people. <clears throat> and this is why, this is part of the reason why, um, the uh, apparition in the New World was accepted by the Spanish. Not just because of its miraculous nature, but because it was consistent with um, <clears throat> what she's done for the Spanish people in the past. She helped conquer um, the Aztecs. You know, she, the, the statue that Hernan Cortes carried was Our Lady of Guadalupe from Spain. Uh, so she was associated with helping conquer the Aztecs. And yet, when one of those Aztecs converted, she appeared to who? To the Aztec. And that's not unusual because the Spanish people were a mix of many races. And what was most important to the Spanish was their Catholic faith. That's the whole reason for uh, the issue with the conversos and the, the Spanish Inquisition. And so, <clears throat> so it was consistent. There was a healing, healing of Juan Bernardino. There was the leaving of a holy garment, um, the tilma <clears throat> and the image. Um, and she called herself Mother to uh, to Juan Diego and she's pregnant in the image which is again consistent with Mary as mother uh, which is the sign that she gave to St. James in Spain <clears throat> and so it seems that um, these signs were recognized by the Spanish um, who accepted the the image as an authentic uh, apparition and gift from Our Lady. <clears throat> it also, there's, there's other signs that go along with it that give support from a Spanish perspective. The image itself is Our Lady of Revelation. You know, the woman clothed with the sun standing on the moon, uh, crowned with stars. Um, it's uh, one of the signs that was involved in the uh, event or the Castilian Roses. Well, Castile was the kingdom that they came from in Spain. Uh, so they were roses that were unique to Spain and would have been familiar to them. And <clears throat> and so that 
was a miracle that wasn't oriented towards the Aztecs. It was oriented towards the Spanish. There was the um, the, the the flowering of roses, spring roses, in winter on a hill where Our Lady appeared and asked for a church to be built. Well, that is the mirror of what happened in Rome where it was summer and snow fell on a hill where Our Lady asked for a church to be built. Uh, and that happened to be the church where Our Lady of Guadalupe was originally housed, the, the, the statue. And so that connection um, must have been made. Um, <clears throat> of course, Juan Bernardino's healing, consistent with what was done throughout Spanish Marian history. And then the biggest evidence that we have that um, the Spanish recognized the importance and the meaningfulness of this uh, apparition is the, um, the title that they adopted, which was Guadalupe, Our Lady of Guadalupe. So <clears throat> that's basically my presentation on what Our Lady of Guadalupe means to the Spanish. Uh, what she meant to the Spanish at the time. Um, she's the, the conqueror of pagans, heretics, apostates, the healer of diseases. She's a corrector and a catechizer. Right? She corrects the Spanish in their um, treatment of the Indians, uh, especially the converts. And she catechizes, which we'll see more, um, which we'll see more in episode two of this series. <clears throat> but she's a mother. She's their mother, and she's now a mother of the, um, the Aztecs who've converted. And, just as a final little tidbit, um, anybody, any Spanish person who had, uh, who had been to Our Lady of Guadalupe Monastery in Spain, um, basically any time from 1498 onward might have seen this and might have recognized it in Our Lady of Guadalupe. So in 1498 an image was hung. It's a, a statue um, kind of uh, well it's a statue that, that was hung um, <clears throat> in the choir loft of Our Lady of Guadalupe Monastery. It's known as the Virgin del Coro. And it looks a lot like Our Lady of Guadalupe. And that was hung 30 years before Our Lady appeared in Mexico. Amazing. Well, that'll do it for my presentation. Thank you for being with me. Let's finish this uh, presentation with a prayer to Our Lady in thanksgiving for just the beauty of, of, of this event, um, her love for her people, uh, for her children in the church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.